Hello everybody and welcome to the Winecast. At the request of a viewer, I'm taking on a topic that I've been remiss in not covering sooner. Though I've done casts on the specifics of rosé production as well as on various forms of sparkling wine production, I haven't given that level of attention to either still red or white wine production. Though there's a lot of overlap between white and red production, there are also key differences between the two. And to give each style its proper due, I'll be tackling them in two separate casts. And this week, I'm kicking off with red wine. So let's take a quick tour of how that style is made from crush to bottle. After red grapes are harvested, they are brought to the winery for an event known colloquially in the trade as crush. Because, true to its name, it involves crushing the grapes to release their juice. Though there are still wineries that do it old school and crush the grapes by foot in a vat, most put their grapes through a device called a crusher destemmer that, true to its name, destems the grapes and lightly crushes them. The destemming process is optional. Stems can add tannins and flavor compounds that can, depending on how dry or lignified the stems are, be bitter, herbaceous, or, in the case of drier, more lignified stems, more like brown baking spices. Stems can also moderate the acid and sugar levels in the juice if they're left in, so a winemaker may decide to turn the destemmer off and just crush the grapes with the stems on in order to add tannins or desirable flavor characteristics to the wine he hopes to make. Alternately, he can destem and then add a portion of the stems back to the juice, and if he's interested in promoting the suite of flavors and aromas that come from carbonic maceration, he may just skip the crushing step altogether and dump the whole clusters, stems and all, into a fermentation vessel. If the winemaker does destem and opts not to add back any stems, then the stemless crushed grapes and their juice form a slurry called must that runs down an inclined table to a pump where it can be transferred to a bin or a tank. Once in a fermentation vessel like a bin or a tank, the must can undergo a number of procedures before fermentation begins, all of which are optional and depend in large part on the type of wine that the winemaker wants to craft. If a winemaker is looking to make a wine using yeast that came in with the grapes or is naturally ambient in the winery, then she may just let the wine do its thing and start fermenting. But natural or wild yeast can be unreliable and quirky, and many winemakers prefer to work with a commercially produced yeast strain that gives more consistent outcomes. To this end, a winemaker may dose the must with sulfur dioxide, or SO2, to kill any wild yeast as well as to kill any bacteria that could cause spoilage or off flavors and aromas later in the process. After the SO2 treatment, the winemaker can inoculate the must with commercial yeast to kick off fermentation, or she may opt to let the wine undergo a cold soak or a cold maceration by cooling the temperature of the must down to a point that inhibits fermentation. Cold soaking helps extract flavor and color compounds from the skins of the grapes, but it doesn't extract much in the way of tannin, which extracts better in the presence of alcohol. So a cold soak can be a way to give the aromatics and flavors, particularly the fruit flavors, as well as the pigment of the finished wine a boost while keeping the tannins in check. Cold soaks usually last around five to six days at the winemaker's discretion. Finally, if any adjustments need to be made to the must, such as adding sugar or chaptalizing to increase the final alcohol content, or acidifying the must if the grapes were overly ripe or otherwise low in acid, this is the best time to make those adjustments, contingent, of course, on whether those particular practices are legal where the wine is being made. Once fermentation begins, the juice will continue to macerate on the skins, continuing to extract flavor, pigment, and aroma compounds, but now also extracting tannins thanks to the increasing presence of alcohol in the must that acts as a solvent. Depending on what she wants the character of the wine to end up as, the winemaker can manage the temperature of the fermentation and let it run from cool to warm, with cooler fermentations delivering more in the way of fruit and floral characteristics. Fermentation temperature, that used to be managed by placing the vat of wine in a cool part of the cellar, can now be managed technologically with refrigerated tanks and other tools. Either way, temperature is one of the most important factors a winemaker has to attend to in wine production, and if the fermentation gets out of control and starts running hot, that can spell disaster, with high temperatures causing the aromatic and flavor compounds in the wine to vaporize and robbing the wine of any character, or by killing the yeast before fermentation is accomplished, resulting in a stuck fermentation and some residual sugar. 
Depending on the yeast and the temperature, as well as the sugar content of the wine, a successful fermentation can run from a few days to a few weeks. Thanks to the carbon dioxide that forms as a byproduct of fermentation, the grape skins and pulp will rise to the top of the tank or vat that the wine is fermenting in and form a thick cap. Careful management of this cap of skins and pulp ensures that the cap remains in contact with the wine to maximize extraction of pigment, flavor, and tannin. There are three basic strategies to managing the cap that a winemaker can employ. She can elect to punch the cap back down into the wine on a regular basis to keep the skins and fermenting juice in contact, a technique also known by its French name, pigeage. This strategy is especially useful if the juice is fermenting in a simple vat or bin with no outlet on the bottom of the vessel to pump the juice over. If the fermentation vessel does have a means to pump the juice from under the cap, back onto the top of the cap, this strategy called remontage in French can also be employed, as well as a similar technique called délestage, or rack and return, that removes the juice from under the cap into a separate vessel and then adds it back all at once to the original vessel, making for greater aeration of the fermenting wine in the process. Once fermentation is complete, the wine in the vessel, known by its French name Van de Goutte, can be pumped or run off from the cap. This is the main part of what will eventually end up bottled as wine. The skin and pulp can then be pressed and an additional wine is extracted from them that is very tannic and dark and is known as Von de Presse. The Von de Presse is usually reserved and then added back, or not, to the Von de Goot at the winemaker's discretion depending on the character he wants the finished wine to have. Though the juice is now wine and could be bottled as such, there are usually a few more steps that the wine will go through before ending up under glass. Almost all red wines will go through a process called malolactic fermentation, or more accurately, since it isn't a true fermentation, malolactic conversion, in which the very tart malic acid in the wine will be converted by various lactic acid bacteria into the smoother, richer, and rounder in the mouth lactic acid. Though this process can occur naturally, winemakers usually deliberately induce it by adding lactic acid bacteria to the wine, and while it's usually induced after the wine has fermented, it can occur at other stages in the process as well. Like I said, virtually all red wines go through it. In fact, the only exception I can think of off the top of my head is Red Vino Verde from Portugal, a wine style in which a refreshing acidity is highly desired. Aging gives the various components in the wine time to integrate, and most winemakers will want to give their reds some time to age, which may take place in oak barrels or in some other medium. By this stage in the process, most of the gross particulate matter, like skin and pulp, is gone from the wine, but there are still lots of smaller particles left in solution. Over time, most of these will settle to the bottom of whatever vessel the wine is being aged in, and then the wine can be racked off of it, but if the winemaker wants a wine free of any particles, then it can be run through a filter or it can be fined by adding one of a number of substances to the wine, like egg whites or bentonite clay, for example, that will form ionic bonds with the particles in suspension and pull them out of solution, leaving a particle-free wine. Though this is much more of an issue in white wines, some of the particles in solution are proteins that can turn color in brown when exposed to heat. So fining or filtering these particles out effectively heat stabilizes the wine and prevents unwanted browning later. The wine can also be cold stabilized by lowering the temperature to precipitate out tartrate crystals or wine diamonds that might otherwise form in the bottle and be off-putting to consumers. Finally, the wine is ready for bottling or for whatever packaging it's destined for. Unless the wine is a single varietal wine all made from the same batch of grapes or different grape varietals that were crushed and made into wine together, at some point during these final steps, blending will also take place. But that, along with more details about some of these steps, is a subject for another cast. Thanks for joining me for another wine cast. Hopefully this cast left you with a basic but solid idea about how red wines are made, and look for another cast in the very near future that will give white wines the same treatment. If this cast was helpful and enjoyable, please like and subscribe if you haven't already. Thanks to everyone who's left a comment, suggestion, or request for me. I really enjoy hearing from you, and the requests have left me with a lot of great ideas for casts to pursue, like this one, so please keep them coming. I'm your host, The Unknown Winecaster, and I'm out. 
Enjoy the grape, but always enjoy it responsibly.